This is the second time in less than a year an officer's actions have led to an investigation. Last August, an officer accidentally shot a 73-year-old woman during a police training session. The state attorney's office is still investigating that shooting. At about 10.30 last night, an off-duty Tulsa County Sheriff's deputy saw a woman run across Peoria near Pine and collapse. The deputy says that woman had a single stab wound to her chest. The victim and her attacker allegedly got in a fight at a nearby bus stop. Police say the victim is in stable condition now. They do not have a suspect at this time. Due tonight, a case of road rage ends in gunfire. Metro says two cars pulled into a gas station parking lot near Jones and Robindale after tempers started flaring on the road. That's when one of the drivers pulled a gun and fired a shot into the air. No one was hit and the shooter was arrested. A rollover accident slowed traffic on I-91 North in Springfield tonight. State police were still trying to find out how this pickup truck ended up on its roof in the breakdown lane of I-91, just past the on-ramp from the city's north end. State Trooper Brian Martinez told 22 News there were no reports of any injuries. Back at home, a terrifying accident, all caught on camera involving a school bus. That bus, loaded with high school basketball players and cheerleaders, Look at this. On its way to a game in Illinois, it slams into a van and then flips over on its side. New at 6, we're getting our first look at the three suspects accused of stealing guns and other valuables from travelers' luggage at McCarran International Airport. Now, police say the three men were employees at the airport working for a third-party company and admitted to the crime. There are reports of an airstrike involving civilian casualties carried out by the U.S. military on Thursday in southern Afghanistan. Media suggests more than 20 people may have died in the strike. The U.N. mission for Afghanistan tweeted that it will look into the reports of an attack. And earlier, the Pentagon spokesman for the operation in Afghanistan, Brigadier General Charlie Cleveland, confirmed the airstrike. We're aware of the allegations of civilian casualties and take every allegation very seriously. We'll work with our Afghan partners to review all related material. The U.S. airstrikes have hit the wrong target before. In October of 2015, in the Afghani city of Kunduz, Doctors Without Borders Hospital was hit on a strike that killed 42. Later in September last year in Deir Ezzor, over 90 Syrian army soldiers were killed. The following month, eight family members were killed in the Iraqi village by U.S. airstrike. Meanwhile, the latest reports show the Afghan government has lost 15 percent of the country's territory to the Taliban over the past year. Whereas Russia is trying to take a grip on the situation and has invited six countries, including Afghanistan, for talks in Moscow on February the 15th. There's no doubt that at some point there's going to be a change in the American policy because uh, any American uh, analyst looking realistically at the situation realize that the war is stalemated at best and being lost at worst and that they've got to find a political solution. A U.S. Special Forces soldier was severely injured Thursday following an attack on a military base in the Helmand province in Afghanistan. According to the military, the soldier was advising Afghan troops embroiled in a bitter battle with the Taliban. The attack wrapped up a deadly week in Afghanistan. The International Committee of the Red Cross suspended operations in the country this week after six of their aid workers were gunned down in Jiaozan province, according to the governor there. The attackers are suspected ISIS militants. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, a suicide bomber successfully carried out an assault on the country's Supreme Court in Kabul, killing at least 19. The U.S. has been at war in Afghanistan officially for 15 years. As of date, there are still approximately 8,500 American troops in the country. 
leading an additional 6,400 NATO troops. Meanwhile, this week, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced he will host a conference this month in Moscow to discuss the Afghan conflict and the growth of ISIS in the region. The talks will include Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. Moscow is also hoping to include the Taliban in political discussion. No NATO members will attend. We're going to move on now to the breaking news this morning. A powerful earthquake hitting the Philippines in the middle of the night. There are deaths and injuries and frantic rescue efforts happening as we speak. The powerful quake just tore through the homes, leveled commercial buildings and gas stations, and sent chunks of concrete from apartments just crashing down onto cars below. Much of the city is still without power, and response teams from the national government are rushing more than 8,000 emergency food packs to families in the harder to reach areas. A 6.7 earthquake has hit the Philippines island of Mindanao, killing at least six people and injuring over 117 seriously. The tremor's epicenter at a depth of 10 kilometers was just to the east of the city of Surigao. It's the Philippines' strongest earthquake since 1879, although the archipelago's location on the Pacific Ring of Fire means it has frequent tremors. This morning, with visibly shattered roadways and massive cracks running through the airport runways, engineers in several major port cities are assessing the damage and preparing for possible aftershocks. Many people spent the night in open spaces like parks and sheltered areas, and Surigao's airport has been closed after cracks appeared in the runway. <laughs> Iran and Sweden have signed several memoranda of understanding during a visit by the Swedish Prime Minister to boost bilateral ties. The two sides signed documents in various fields, including science, education, roads and urban development, urban development. communications and information technology, as well as women's empowerment. Following the ceremony, Iran's President Hassan Rouhani said that Iran and Sweden have the capacity and the potential to enhance bilateral relations in various fields. Iran's nuclear deal with six world powers has paved the way for broader trade and economic relations between Iran and the European Union, in particular with Sweden. Both sides are determined to return the trade level to the pre-sanctions era. We are also willing to establish closer cooperation with Sweden in banking relations. Iran's president says that the EU should provide full support to European companies and banks and prepare proper conditions for better cooperation. The Swedish Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven, stressed the importance of stronger ties between the two countries. The two sides also discussed regional developments, including the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, the issue of Palestine, and Syria ceasefire. The Swedish Prime Minister, heading a high-ranking delegation, arrived in Tehran on Friday. And in Iran, thousands gathered on Friday in Tehran to mark Iranian Revolution Day, the holiday which has been celebrated in the country since 1979 when the U.S.-backed Shah was ousted. It has always been the day when Iranians particularly made their feelings towards the West known. But this time, it was kind of different. Uh, down with the U.S. regime, but uh, long live the American people. Or um, stop hatred against Muslims. Or um, the... U.S. people, the people from America, are welcome oh. to come over to Iran. Uh, and there was one particular, it was uh, an interesting one, uh, terrorism, racism, unilateralism, militarism, populism, together spelled as Trump. So all those Clever. things seen in, you know, first of all, English language banners and slogans in the capital of Iran on a revolution day, it's, it's like we're living in a parallel reality of sorts because this has been like the, the day when uh, anti-West and anti-U.S. moods were uh, probably at, at, at their uh, biggest hype. 
But today it was like that, and maybe it's a sign of things to come uh, in, in, a, in a certain way, especially that Iran is now um, a key card, uh, yeah, a, a key player in the geopolitics. I mean, we were just looking at the, at the images on the screen there. I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it's, exactly. how, how do you even explain that? So what it sounds like to me is that they seem to be anti-Trump but pro-American people today? Bizarrely enough, yes. And that's the first time I've ever seen anything like that because it's always been like we hate Americans, Americans right. are not welcome, and now they say they don't hate, they don't hate the Americans, the they hate the regime, right? I mean, they are wow. against Trump, and this is very spectacular. I think uh, our colleagues from the mainstream media who covered this event today, they didn't really pay attention to the historic background sure. that they've never seen anything like that before. Angry crowds have set cars on fire in southern France protesting against police brutality after allegations of sexual abuse against officers. Now these are latest pictures from the scene. Demonstrators were also throwing what appeared to be firecrackers. The crowd have been carrying banners with names of people who they believe have become victims of police violence. And this comes shortly after another break out of protests in the French capital as dozens of activists occupied a shopping centre. Protests have been taking place for more than a week. The planned visit to the UK by the US President Donald Trump continues to stir controversy among both British officials and ordinary people. UK authorities are trying to set up the state visit at a time when Parliament is not sitting so that Trump won't be able to address lawmakers. The officials are reportedly doing so to avoid a formal rejection. John Burkow, the Speaker of the Lower House of Commons, had earlier said that he was strongly opposed to allowing the US President to address parliamentarians, citing his racist views. In the meantime, Britons have been signing an online petition expressing their opposition to Trump's official visit to their country. So far, more than 1,850,000 people have signed the petition. Se les reconoce también con la construcción de diversas instalaciones para la Armada, el Ejército y la Fuerza Aérea, como, la que, como las que hoy hemos entregado aquí en Zapopan. Tan solo en estas obras se han invertido cerca de mil millones de pesos. Pero más allá de los recursos, lo más importante es que se mantiene a la, a la vanguardia nuestras instalaciones militares. A certain chill has descended on intra-Slavic harmony recently, with news that Moscow is imposing controls on the formerly free Belarusian border. Relations with Minsk are in the freezer. In a press conference a week ago, the Belarusian president lashed out at Russia. Who are they closing the border to today? Who too? What is this 30 kilometer border zone? Do they guard the borders better than we do? A thousand times worse than we do. And they have the borders that need to be guarded, and they need to guard them. It looks to me like a political attack. They should not do that. Russia's move came after Minsk loosened visa requirements with 80 countries. Moscow's worried about who might use this as a way into Russia. There are other quarrels too. Minsk didn't follow Moscow's 2014 ban on Western food imports. Since then, much sanctioned produce has made its way into Russia illegally. And then there are the energy deals Russia says Belarus has been abusing for cheap oil and gas. 
Indeed, observers in Moscow think they've seen this before, and Lukashenko is just angling for a better deal with Moscow. The analyst says Putin believes Lukashenko is bluffing. Indeed, so far the Kremlin is ignoring him with no calls or meetings planned. But the Belarusian president's strongest card is that he knows Moscow needs him. Belarus is a crucial member of Putin's pet geopolitical project, the Eurasian Economic Union of several former Soviet states. Relations might be icier than usual at the moment, but most people expect them to thaw again soon. The truth is that Belarus and Russia are bound together by politics, economics, ethnicity and culture. Putin and Lukashenko are both wily operators and they've been doing this dance for many years now. Edward Snowden is weighing in on reports that Russia might send him back to the U.S. as a gift. Snowden worked for years in the U.S. intelligence community. In 2013, he leaked classified NSA files that showed the U.S. government's mass surveillance programs. The feds charged him with espionage and theft of government property. Since then, he's been holed up in Russia. Anonymous U.S. intelligence officials told NBC News recent Russian talks have centered around handing the whistleblower over to work up favor with President Donald Trump. Uh, one is it would be a win-win for Putin because there is no way after all this time he doesn't have everything in Snowden's brain. He has drained that puppy dry. Uh, you know, he has wrung out whatever intelligence. Remember, Snowden went first to Hong Kong, to China, and then to Moscow. He's been there ever since uh, he leaked all the, uh, the National Security Agency's uh, secrets and damaged his country. Uh, so I think handing over Snowden for Putin would be a, you know, a, a no-brainer for Putin's point of view. What does Trump get? Uh, you know, Trump, as I recall, a couple of years ago said that uh, Snowden should be executed. U.S. immigration officials are reportedly stepping up efforts to round up people who are in the country illegally. In a series of raids this week, authorities arrested dozens and dozens of undocumented immigrants. The government says it's simply enforcing the law and that the raids target those with known criminal records. But some advocacy groups say some people without criminal records have been included. They're calling it the first major action since President Trump signed an executive order on immigration last month. Uh, what President Trump did when he signed his executive order on January 25th was vastly expand that pool. So now it's people with any kind of criminal record, people who have been charged with crimes that would be deemed deportable, um, people who committed uh, public welfare fraud, people who have uh, made false representations to the government, in other words, people who use the f fake social security number to get a job. And so when you start adding all that up, I mean, I've seen estimates that, this, that eight to nine million undocumented immigrants are considered priorities by the Trump administration. So yes, it's a very, very big pool of people that they're going after. I have a seven-year-old, six-year-old grandson that is crying because his mom is in jail. Teresa Velasquez is driving to the jail in Austin, Texas, where her daughter is being detained. She and her husband were arrested on Friday morning after agents with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, pulled over the husband on his way to his construction job. Her husband, Hugo Baltazar Ramirez, was in the U.S. illegally when they met and married. They never went through the long process to obtain legal residency. He's been on probation for drunk driving, and now his family fears he'll be deported. Fearful that President Trump's anti-immigration rhetoric would become reality, Austin's new sheriff took a stand last month. She joined the Sanctuary City movement, instructing her officers not to cooperate with federal immigration agents here. The longtime liberal city earned the ire of both the president and Republican Texas governor Greg Abbott. The city lost $1.5 million in state funding. How is, that, how is that doing your job, separating people, separating, separating families? For years, millions of undocumented workers in the United States have been able to live peacefully in the moment, waiting for promised immigration reform to provide a long-term solution. Now, with reports of a surge in immigration arrests in Austin and across the country, that hope for the future has been replaced by fear of families being torn apart. Well, we begin with this morning's top story. After a troubled launch of his signature executive order, President Trump is now preparing a plan B for his controversial travel ban. Late yesterday, the president told reporters aboard Air Force One that while his current executive order is being challenged by the courts, he may file a brand new executive order com this coming week. Errol Barnett is in our Washington bureau with the latest. Errol, good morning. 
Good morning. Yes, after a White House visit and long handshake yesterday, President Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Abe headed to Mar-a-Lago to tee off and discuss the TPP. But before he left, President Trump continued to defend his controversial travel ban, which sits in limbo while the courts determine its legality. En route to his Florida retreat for the weekend, President Trump suggested he will act early next week to restore what he calls extreme vetting measures. We'll win that battle, but we also have a lot of other options, including just filing a brand new order on Monday. During a joint press conference earlier in the day with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, the president wouldn't rule out any legal options, including an appeal to the Supreme Court. Sources say one possible option, stepping up that review even without a travel ban in place, and coming up with tougher new vetting measures. That would make much of the executive order unnecessary, avoiding legal problems ahead. Benjamin Wittes of the Brookings Institution. There is a concern that the reckless manner in which uh, President Trump uh, uh, did this order and uh, the litigation that ensued will uh, cause the courts to put limits uh, on uh, perfectly legitimate authorities. Now, there is a chance the entire California-based federal appeals court could review Thursday's ruling by the three judges. And Mr. Trump could also ask the Supreme Court to intervene. But, Scott, at this preliminary phase, that's unlikely. Over the last three years, there's been a spike in the number of people being killed by police officers, both in the field and in police custody. This growing crisis gave birth to the Black Lives Matter movement, but the problem goes even deeper than most people realize. Americans are now all too familiar with names like Michael Brown and Eric Garner, as well as Sandra Bland and Freddie Gray. Those names have become synonymous with the abuse that takes place against citizens by police officers. But there are some very important differences in these cases. The main difference being that Bland and Gray were killed by officers after being taken into custody. And that's the part of the story of police brutality that most people don't know about. In the six-year period between 2003 and 2009, an estimated 3,000 arrest-related homicides of African Americans occurred in the United States, and 99% of those were committed by police officers. However, the Justice Department's told us that the number of people of all races killed while in police custody is likely higher, but they don't know because the reporting of those homicides is left of the police and jail personnel, and underreporting or mislabeling homicides is common practice in the U.S. One of the more serious recent cases involves Matthew Ajiba Day, a 22-year-old bipolar college student in Georgia who was tased while in a restraining chair in 2015, and he died still strapped to the chair. The disturbing video from a camera attached to the taser itself shows the victim in the restraining chair. You can see where the red dot is, which is the light from the taser pointed at his torso and his groin. It's important to understand that other Western countries don't have a problem this serious. In the year 2015, uh, 2014, excuse me, police officers in the United Kingdom only killed one person in that same year. Canadian authorities killed 14 and German police officers didn't kill a single person in 2014. The problem is only getting worse as American police officers continue to operate with a Wild West mentality, partly because they only receive about a quarter of the training that officers in, under, in other countries receive. Alleged the NYPD issued hundreds of thousands of illegal citations. The majority of these citations were for minor offenses such as trespassing or drinking in public, issued as a result result of the city's notorious stop-and-frisk policy. The suit covers 900,000 citations, approximately a quarter of all citations issued during the time period, and claims that police officers target minority communities in an effort to reach specific quotas. The city is denying that the quota system was ever put in place, but as part of the very nominal money settlement, New York has at least agreed to notify all enforcement departments that quotas are not allowed. That's a giant step forward in slowing down the stop and fisk frenzy that's now taken hold in New York City.
was a visit designed to show the warm relationship between the two nations, if not between the two leaders. The U.S. president offered an awkward White House welcome to the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. In the Oval Office, the men spoke little, only smiling for cameras. At one point, Abe even rolled his eyes at the unusual interaction. Despite a clumsy start, Donald Trump affirmed America would honor long-standing security to Japan in light of regional territorial disputes with China and provocations by North Korea. But given Trump's recent executive order withdrawing the U.S. from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact, Abe was eager to stress economic ties, promising, in exchange for security, Japanese investments in American jobs and infrastructure, including a high-speed train. Maglev technology could get you from Washington, D.C. to New York, where Trump Tower is, in one hour. But Trump appeared irritated when reporters pressed the president on next steps following Thursday's court ruling upholding the halt of his ban on travelers from seven Muslim-majority nations. Well, your question was unrelated to what we're here for today, but I'll answer it. Uh, he announced new vetting measures and the promise of future court challenges to any effort to stop his executive order. We'll be doing something very rapidly uh, having to do with additional security for our country. You'll be seeing that sometime next week. Despite any challenges with chemistry, both leaders insist they have a strong rapport. It underscores just how important the United States and Japan see their relationship when it comes to trade and security. Uh, there was someone who was noticeably missing, Melania Trump. The First Lady did not join uh, Japan's First Lady as she toured a nearby university and the National Cherry Blossom Festival meeting at the Japanese embassy. Melania Trump was not there. Today, uh, Mrs. Trump, who we know is living in New York and staying with Bear until he finishes his school year, in all fairness, did not join Mrs. Abe this morning, um, which made it a little bit awkward to have her do these events alone, only because in the past we've seen Mrs. Abe with Michelle Obama. We've even seen Mrs. Abe with Laura Bush. They uh, toured Mount Vernon together. So it was a little unusual not to have a first lady or a stand-in or an Ivanka Trump join Mrs. Abe uh, this morning on her two events here in Washington. For generations, life on Isle de Jean Charles has remained unchanged. The fertile waters of Louisiana's coastline provide a way of life people here cherish. But this is a community that's slowly being taken back by the sea. Just one flood-prone road connects residents to the mainland, and as sea levels rise and land is lost, life is becoming harder. The government has granted $48 million to move this entire community, but progress is slow. Many realize that Alder Jean Charles is living on borrowed time, but the prospect of losing tribal lands and culture is wrenching. If the people here are the first climate change refugees in the United States, it seems almost certain they won't be the last. Louisiana's losing around 75 square kilometers of land every year, and as we've seen here, it affects the poorest communities. And environmentalists say this is just the start of things to come. Finding a sheltered place to park a ship off Antarctica can be a problem, but not on this occasion. Running the nose of the 12,000-ton Russian research vessel up against the glacier gives the scientists on board the perfect platform to carry out their work. This has to be one of the most extraordinary places on the planet. I am on the edge of Antarctica, and what you see behind me is the Mertz Glacier. This glacier runs from the East Antarctic Plateau right down to the sea and when it reaches the sea the glacier comes out 40 kilometers over the ocean to where we are here. Scientists are fascinated by this particular glacier because in 2010 an enormous chunk around 75 by 35 kilometers broke off after it was nudged by another larger iceberg. Using this five million dollar robotic submarine the scientists had hoped to look at what they thought would be a vertical wall of ice dropping 500 meters from the surface. But to their surprise the team discovered a huge underwater cavern beneath the glacier. The seawater was warmer than they'd expected and there was surprising evidence of melt. 
The discovery is consistent with other findings in this part of Antarctica. Scientists have found warm ocean currents are now flowing further south, resulting in increased glacial melt. This team are keen to know what effect this is having on life on the sea floor and deploy the submarine again. Here, at a depth of 900 metres, they have a rare opportunity to take samples and observe a wide variety of cold water species. To have the capacity to take those sorts of images and collect specimens and know exactly where they came from is amazing and to witness the behaviour at the same time, the beautiful moment where the Holothurian, the sea cucumber, was dancing. In, in such an unexplored environment, everything is of interest. The samples will now be taken back to the scientists' labs. Numerous tests, including DNA analysis, will be carried out to create a map of this rich and diverse marine environment. The Southern Ocean produces a large part of the nutrients that support life in the rest of the world's oceans. Changes here will affect us all. В России впервые со времен СССР восстановлено единое радиолокационное поле противоракетной обороны. Оно обеспечивает контроль за различными запусками вокруг страны в радиусе 6 тысяч километров. На днях в Орске, Барнауле и Енисейске ввели три новых радиолокационных станции. is right here in Iran, where the Secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, Ali Shamkhani, says his country continues to allow Russia to use its airspace for operations in Syria. Shamkhani said Iran has decided to do so because Tehran and Moscow have a fully strategic cooperation. He stressed that the Russians' use of the Iranian airspace is based on prior coordination. Shamkhani also said in the recent cases, Russian warplanes have only used Iran's airspace without having refueling operations. It was in August when Russian aircrafts for the first time used an airbase in western Iran for strikes in Syria. The move was part of Tehran-Moscow cooperation in fighting terrorism in the war-torn country. U.S. President Donald Trump has reacted to his Iranian counterpart who has said that Tehran will never yield to the language of threats. Trump says that Iran's president had better be careful about his words. Hassan Rouhani said on Friday that Tehran will strongly respond to any move by ill-wishers. Since he took office last month, the U.S. president has adopted a hostile policy towards Iran. He has slapped new sanctions and put Iranians on an immigration ban. Trump has also said that Iran has been formally put on notice over its ballistic missile tests. Uh, you know, this is saber-rattling and it's aggressive rhetoric and one doesn't have to pay too much attention to that. Uh, Trump is probably in need of some distractions from the, the, the domestic policies he's trying to initiate uh, that have, you know, been very unfavorably received. So, so the rhetoric is predictable. What what really happens, though? Uh, yeah, I think Iran has been targeted. I think Israel's, uh, you know, has wanted this for a long time, and whether that means a direct military confrontation, I don't know. But, but I expect pressure on Iran to continue, and, uh, you know, General Mattis, who, whose appointment may well have been the result of Israeli advice in the first place, uh, you know, Mattis uh, certainly uh, has always had a, a, a very hostile attitude towards Iran. So we'll see, but, but this is a continuation of uh, a policy we saw with Obama, just it was more in the shadows.